So, the, so those are the, if you look at church history, when someone really gets close to God, they either go off and become a hermit because they can't live in the mm. world yes. or they become a martyr like, like St. Stephen. But now what God is doing that third way, God's allowing, he doesn't want his um, children to be, start to get a profound union in them. He doesn't want them to become hermits and he doesn't want them to become all martyrs. <laughs> so mm. some will obviously, but, and they're going to be in society and be interiorly radiate the Holy Spirit. So the new become uh, just like it's very Marian too. So that's the key of um, uh, Mary was able to walk in the fullness of God. Like scriptural speaking, to look at it just very quickly, scriptural perspective is the whole scriptural journey could be looked at. Who could walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? All through, ever since the fall of Adam, saints like Moses and Elijah had little um, presences of the Holy Spirit. Even King David had like mm. touches of Sister David. The Spirit seized upon him when he was anointed and never left him. But no one could fully walk in the Holy Spirit until mm. Jesus had the full presence of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus wants to raise other apostles who could share in the divine life on the Holy Spirit. And that's going to radiate in communities and places. And they will reach, please God, um, a tipping point. We will reach sort of like um, where people will start to see in the witnesses of people, um, there's a joy and a presence and an interior connection that comes with the life in God through the sacraments of the Eucharist and confession and life and through reading the mystics that mm. um, they're missing out upon. It's not a, the material things, you know, can't give you a level of joy. And you cannot, even other relationships that people are trying to find in relationships, something which only God can give them, that has to be that interior like a presence of God. Um, yeah, so that's how I see this new era coming about as purifications unfold and chastisements and difficulties unfold. More and more the people will go into prayer and go into intercession and encounter with God. And we know, you know, there's um, mm. you know, things like the warning and illumination of a conscience and that, uh, which the Lord will more and more, it's lovely to hear Father Celso speak about, you know, what's going to happen is going to be such a beautiful era. There's going to be such outpourings of grace and miracles, just like the early church in many ways, and such astounding miracles because as people more and more let go of the world and let go of um, human uh, supports and, and like human um, yeah, yeah, crutches, um, mm. uh, the beautiful presence of God. And, you know, you read the book of Isaiah where it says, you know, the sun will glow seven more times more brightly and even the bells of the cows mm. will be holy, you know, um, yes. sort of thing. So that's yeah, so it's a beautiful um, just to keep on as we see these horrible things um, unfold and uh, people being hurt and uh, that to pray for them, to love them interiorly, enter into places of prayer with God, to read and hope of a new era that's about to unfold in a beautiful, glorious world, which we can't imagine at the moment. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show today. We're very excited and blessed to have with us our own Australian priest for the first time on Mother and Refuge, Father Emil Milat. So, Father, thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we introduce you, do you mind if we start with a prayer? Sure. So, begin in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for this Easter you know, season where we're in that time leading up to Pentecost where it's a symbolized liturgically with the apostles in the upper room. There, I'm around our invoking the Holy Spirit. So we too are in this a time of um, of a new Pentecost. The popes have prayed for some time for a new Pentecost in the church since the Second Vatican Council. So we do pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us as we are praying and journeying together um, in the whole church. And we ask um, our Mother Mary to put her mantle around us. Uh, also Saint Joseph as he was instrumental in making a space in the early church for Christ to be born. We pray that he would help us as we talk and share to allow this new gift of living the divine world to be born in our midst as well. We seek the powerful intercession of Saint Michael the Archangel, the Archangels, and the Holy Souls in Purgatory. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Marina's our guest host um, today. So Marina, would you like to share uh, a little bit about Father Emil. <laughs> yes, um, Father Emil is uh, the parish priest of uh, Our Lady Help of Christians, Rodon. Um, and uh, Father, I learned that you were a lawyer before you became a priest. Could you tell us more sure. about it? Uh, yeah, sure. No, sure. I, I studied economics and law at Australia National University. I started in 1987. Seems a long time ago now. And so I did a, a double a degree. And then um, it was, and then I just naturally gravitated into the public service working as a lawyer. And I remember my calling was a bit like St. Matthew because um, he was sitting at the customer's house there counting his money and Jesus comes along and says, <laughs> you come and follow me. And I remember thinking literally at that time when the call happened, where will I spend all my money? <laughs> will I invest it in shares or will I put it in coins? And 
So I was literally counting my money and then um, all oh. of a sudden I heard a talk about the priesthood at the parish and then I said to my dad, it's a shame there's not enough priests. And he said, it's a bit of a joke. Why don't you do something about it sort of thing? And I thought, never thought about it, to be honest. So, yeah, so that was a great preparation. Every journey is particularly interesting and you unique um it was interesting too when i discovered i remembered my confirmation saint's name was matthew and i'd forgotten so he was obviously a text collector who became an apostle yeah. father may i ask when you first heard about the writings of Luisa picaretta yeah sure i was in the seminary we had a, um, a home rosary group which was lovely so every tuesday night if i recall correctly um, we would actually be invited to go to the parish and they had a statue of our lady that went around and they had a home rosary. So I thought it's a great pastoral contact, you know, to get away from the books and so forth. So, and then I would, um, I had a lovely time praying the rosary with these lovely families and homes around the eastern suburbs. And then one night after, at the end of the rosary, they're playing a video about the divine will. And I saw this video and it just caught my imagination straight away. That was in 1997. And those were early days about knowing about Luisa Picaretta and the mm -hmm. divine will. It's very hard to get your hands on her writings and so forth. and But it just gripped me straight away. It was good timing for me because I was um, learning theology. I was I like developing my spiritual life as a seminarian. And so that was a great time. I had a lot of resources around me and I had a natural inclination towards um, the prophetic writings, the being from the Croatian background and having a great devotion to Our Lady. I could see that unfortunately in the Catholic Church, um, the whole element of prophecy is not a huge I hasn't been particularly strong compared to some churches, except for Our Lady. Um, Our Lady, mm -hmm. we know through her apparitions, approved ones, uh, has a strong prophetic element and brings that into the church. So, so I had a natural inclination. I remember being very interested um, in things like Saint Justina. She was only a blessed then in 1997, and I remember thinking, I reckon she's going to be an important saint one day in the church. <laughs> and then, to my delight, when I, she was ordained, so she was canonized couple of months before I was ordained. So that was a lovely, oh, wow. and, then, and I had a great inkling that Divine Mercy uh, Sunday would be very significant for the church. So when Pope John Paul II declared her the first saint of the new millennium and also I declared the Sunday after Easter to be Divine Mercy on Sunday. And other saints like Padre Pio was only a servant of God in those days. So I remember this Padre Pio, I think he will be a significant saint in the future of the mm -hmm. church. So when he became a blessed and then he was canonized. Um, so I like to be, <laughs> You get on the watch. <laughs> up and coming states. So. <laughs> states. I had a bit of, it's a lovely hobby to have. I think even like Eileen O'Connor, because um, I was in the eastern suburbs, used, oh, to go yeah. down, used to go down and pray at her chapel, which was quite great. I used to, you know, I was learning how to become pastoral in those days. I'd have like mm. a catechist class and be so exhausted afterwards. I'd go to her chapel and just, and just like fall on my knees and, and pray <laughs> in her chapel. And, and oh, I discovered wow. all about uh, Eileen O'Connor, and she was one of the natural mystics. Um, here in the Church of Australia. So her cause for a bit of her beatification is what I've been mm. opened about six, seven years now. So, so I got her on my radar too as well. Hopefully the second Australian saint, right? Yeah, second And she was a mystic, so that's good. Mary McKillop was a bit of a mystic in many ways. Um, and some of her writings opens up the door to this idea of um, living in God's will rather than simply doing mm. God's will. So obviously, and there were several others I won't mention at the moment but um so Luisa Picaretta was one of them so the more I delved into her writings I um researched a bit about her and got involved with um other priests and I started to connect with um yeah the priests who were promoting her writings and the priest like Father Carlos Massieu who was in charge of the cause of her beatification he just grew very mm. nicely and steadily and I was just growing in an awareness and I saw that it really um brought a beautiful a dimension to my priesthood and mm. to my own personal spiritual life, particularly um, this idea of of actually um, sharing in the divine nature, so divinization. Um, mm. That would not have come to me in the church without studying the writings of Luisa Picaretta. So the more I started to think about it and research to think, well, does the church actually teach that we can share in God's the divine nature? And then I would read like the church fathers god became mm. man so man can become god like saint augustine and so that's, really that's like a, a stumbling block for a lot of people isn't it that mm. when they come across that the divine will talks about divinization mm. they, they find it somewhat like a something gnostic or something mm. that's not catholic but it is catholic isn't it 
It is. It's very Catholic. It's a heart of ecclesiastical. You know, if you just go in the Second Vatican Council, the whole idea was to. Um, I'm a universal call to holiness and to share in the nature of God. And then I would just be naturally drawn into authors like Archbishop Fulton Sheen. You know, he mm-hmm. would say things like, um, Christ enable us to have another nature. It's, it's as if a rock um, was able to sprout a rose. It's not in the nature of a rock. He actually uses that analogy in his book. Mm-hmm. Uh, a rock does not naturally of its nature sprout a rose, but it's given another nature. So we know that Christ had a two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. We only have so one person and two natures, we are one person with one nature, but through baptism we've given another nature. So it's beautiful to explore that. And you read like the first letter of John, that Peter speaks about sharing mm-hmm. the divine nature. The first letter of John says even something amazing. He says you are already children of God now, but what we are to be in the future it has not yet been revealed. All that we know we should be like him. So so that was really lovely wow. for the last so – so for the last um, – 27 years or so it's i've been journeying with it reading so um i read like the hours of the passion is one of her writings and that's a beautiful spiritual uh, part of the spiritual life to read about the passion of our lord mm, and, yeah. Yeah, but particularly on um, her massive work the book of heaven to read one extract every day has been really wonderful to read that mm, extract and mm. to grapple with it to chew in it and to speak to other holy priests and religious about it. And then what really started to um, have a profound effect upon me in some ways, the laity wanted a priest to guide them in the writings. So that was a big step. So the laity was growing amongst the lay faithful, um, particularly when I went to Maria. I was a parish priest at Sacred Heart Parish in Maria. And there was quite a strong, vibrant group there who were reading the the writings in the Book of Heaven. So they said, Father, can you sort of like um, teach us about this, show us that it's in, in accordance with that Catholic faith and teaching. So then there you go. <laughs> so, wow. then I, so then I, that really drew me into articulating it and, and particularly my calling, I find, to show it really, show how it is consistent and dovetails into our Catholic theology yeah. and teaching. That's very important. And then we started to get um, speakers come to Australia. It's really fantastic. Um, we had... Um, we started to get a group of priests who've been reading the writings of Louisa Picadetta. We got together in a Divine World Priest Retreat in Perth in 2012. So we're just a group of 15, 16 priests coming together over in Perth. Australian in priests? Australian priests, yeah. Over mm-hmm. in Perth, all Australian. And then uh, so, uh, that was in, um, uh, I think that was in 2012. And actually, just before that, uh, in 2010, um, they advertised the Year of the Priest in Rome. So as mm-hmm. part of that, um, two divine will priests, one from America, Father Robert Young, and the other one, a Mexican priest who was um, allowed to work full time for the cause of the beatification of Luis Picta, Father Carlos Massieu, mm-hmm. saying that correct. They organised a divine will priest retreat in Carato as part of the Year of the Priest. Oh. So I thought, gee, this will be good. I've been studying the writings for 10 years now or more as a priest, learning about it, studying it, and it's been that's such a, an important part of my spiritual life. And then I thought... Wouldn't that be lovely to, to meet together with a group of priests, spend a week in Rome for the year mm. of the priest, and then we had a, we travelled south to Carato to see Luisa's birthplace. So that was the first ever official divine will priest pilgrimage to Luisa's hometown um, organised. So that was in, in 2010. There were 30 priests. There were 10 priests from America. There were 10 Spanish-speaking priests and 10 Australian priests. So oh, that's wow. that was a quiet... Um, an achievement by the Australian lay faithful. Some of those priests were simply mm. their prayer groups said, Father, I'll pay you to go to Rome. To really? Picadetta and to go and see Father. Go, okay, you're going to pay for me to go to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and did it have a lasting effect on those priests? For sure, for sure. Some, yes. Um, I, um, the ones I know of, for sure. Uh, there were uh, several who continued on, have a have a big impact upon them as well. Um, others, I'm not too sure what sort of impact upon mm. it. I had on there. So that was really lovely to go to Carato to to see where Louisa lived, um, to speak to her archbishop of the time there who was promoting the cause. In fact, the head of the congregation of the Doctrine of Faith gave a talk in the diocese at that time. We went along to the talk about that diocese was blessed to have a number of, of um, servants of God whose cause of beatification mm. was up for Rome. So that was just amazing to travel with those the priests if you read the book son of my will so there's an official autobiography yeah. of louisa called the son of my will and um, in that there's a little reference at the back about these um 30 priests who went to this pilgrimage so yeah so that was great then we came back to australia and had i had a gathering of priests after that in 2012 and then we mm. organized for a divine world speaker to come to australia in 2013 
um, Tony Hickey. So that was that was a huge grace. We had a whole week with this quite articulate, well-researched speaker on the divine law. He himself had seen that the divine law is so deep and profound it can be easily, in some ways easily misinterpreted. He studied mm -hmm. mystical theology, the degree to contextualise it. So he was able to put in a context for us priests and pretty well ever, we had 20 priests at the Benedictine Abbey in Jamboree. And after that week, pretty well, I think every priest there was uh, convinced mm. about it. But then wow. when you go back to parish, you know, it's another world. And I mean, we are talking about really deep, profound spirituality. And the way I like to initially you put it in a perspective and, and like to contextualise it is that if you look at like St. Teresa Avila's interior castle, there's uh, seven levels of this interior mansion. And the first level is just a simply curiosity in the faith, raw evangelization. Most of our time as a parish priest and as a church, we're dealing with people at that level, I mean, if I can say that. Mm. And then you've got, you know, the levels of um, seeking God, having a disciplined interior life, then um, trying to follow and allow God to move you and to walk in the Holy Spirit. So God actually takes the reins. And then you have falling in love with Jesus. You've got engagement and mystical marriage. So you're talking about this really deep level of mystical marriage and beyond. You know, that's I mean, in some ways it's a rarefied spiritual place. And so if you're in a parish, um, it's hard to really, you know, to be in that headspace. But for me, I love to spend that time in that really deep. And, and I feel sometimes there's always going to be in the parish a handful of people who really want something really deeply, profoundly mystical and who want to mm. grapple with, and it's part of our topic we're going to talk about, about your sufferings and people going through so much trials and difficulties, but to learn about uh, the mystical life and how I can share in God's divine nature and beautiful, deep mystical writings that can be really, really helpful. So that's mm. great. So Tony Hickey, he um, in 2013, he led us to that retreat. He went all around Australia, which had a big impact upon the divine world prayer groups around Australia. That was really important. It's the first time a speaker, international speaker of that calibre came to Australia to galvanise, edify um, those who've been writing, mm -hmm. those who've been reading the writings for some time. And then in 2014, Father Joseph Ianuzzi came to Australia. That was another, I think, watershed in the whole blind world movement in Australia because he had just had his thesis approved at the Gregorian University in Rome, which was a mm -hmm. thesis defending Luisa Picaretta's writings. Um, and to showing it in the context of the patristics, um, in the systematic theology, and also in the terms of um, you know modern spiritualists like a Karana. That was just, a, for me, wow, that was another mm. great watershed to see. And again, it drew me naturally into, I could say, rarefied spiritual ideas and concepts, which you, as a, as a parish priest, you normally are dealing with rosters and youth groups and parish pastoral councils and fixing the car park, the leaky roof, and which is all part of um, earthiness and real. Uh, so, so to be able to be able to spend some time in these, what mm. Catholicity is about, is about the Eucharist and um, sharing, you know, eat what you become. So, so it can become what you eat. Mm. So, yes. so that was really good. And then uh, Tony Hickey, it came back in 2015. That was another great the retreat. And then really all the online stuff started to happen. These international mm. speakers started to talk, started to appear online. The Father Robert Young, he did a whole series of um, reflections upon the volumes on Radio Maria. So as I drove my car, I was appointed out to a country area called West Wild and Lake Angelico. So I had a lot of time in the car. So I, would, I listened to Father Robert Young's the talks. And then, you know, and then you had uh, your father, Joseph Ianuzzi, started to become quite prolific to give his uh, talks and teachings. And Francis Hogan, too, you know, started to be mm. quite a prolific. And then, yeah, and then others like your father, Celso, you've had him on your station yep. and um, yeah. several others. So so that's sort of like it's been a wonderful um, a journey over um, 27 years or so. Just, um, just more and more as I read my spiritual writings and I read whether it be through the catechism. And then I started to give, once a year I'd give a talk up in Sydney. Um, I used to go to my um, home home turf up at the um, seminary at Kensington in the chapel and I would invite all the local divine will prayer groups to come to a mass, just a simple mass and a talking and sharing about the divine will. And then um, yes, slowly other groups um, would invite me to give a bit of a talk and a sharing about the divine will. And then it grew to the place where with Zoom, uh, once a month mm. um, now, uh, I like to give a talk on Zoom, invite people just to 
um, um, kind of tune in. And then it helps me. And can all Australians join in with that? Yes, on the Zoom sure. Call? Yeah, sure. No, I've got an email list and I, um, if yeah, I send so Maybe you could give us some details so that those watching might, uh, that are interested can join in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then it's relayed by um, um, Jenny Troy has an email list. She relays my invitation and also... Mm -hmm. Maxine has a like an East Coast Divine Will group and she relays it out to them as well as well. But it's great because each mm -hmm. month I'm like naturally reading theology and naturally got a new book here or there, whether it be Scott Hahn or another, you know, great contemporary mm -hmm. writer or author. And I see, wow, this is just so divine all. And I, t I particularly mm -hmm. um, focus and tease out and to really locate these particular passages and insights that speak about sharing in God's divine nature, in divinization, in um so it's just so great and powerful. Even just last um, a Sunday, um, I went through the a recent a document, Rome, about infinite dignity of the human person. And there's a, so much of that um, mm. which actually um, um, is about yep. the idea of living in God's will. So. Oh, wow. Well, well. And you're talking about the importance of sharing in God's nature and the experience of um, Louisa, from my limited knowledge, is how she shared in Christ's um, passion to a really great degree and that's probably leading into our, what we're going to be talking about today and how the church is going through some turbulent times and, and that we're facing you know the prospect of living through difficulties and sharing in God's passion um, would you be able to discuss that yeah sure sure and I mean that's one of the great things about I'm uh, reading about the writings of Luis Picaretta is you've got the uh, she had that beautiful revelation of the hours of the passion um, mm. which is a beautiful 24 hours um, how the passion of Jesus placed in the 24 hour of a period and sharing in the sufferings of of Jesus uh, you know that the whole point I mean the, the spiritual life do we know is the cross is about dying and rising um, I like to sort of like always think of the cross as um a verb it's not a noun so the cross is in the sense that um mm. it's the sufferings you go through to go from one stage of the spiritual life to a higher stage of the spiritual life so it's not a suffering for the sake of a suffering so so it gives you great hope if you know um you are going to go to a higher spiritual place that this trial is purifying you this trial is making you more loving and caring it's making you more open to god and it's leading you to a deeper stage of the awareness more christ-like that's exactly right more yeah, christ-like so um so louisa had that i mean i mean the beautiful part of the spiritual life and you think you talk about suffering and the passion for me christ had his transfiguration experience before the passion for me that's a very very important mm -hmm. you know when you see uh, the film uh, the passion of christ by mel Gibson, um that's sort of like um is really i mean i would sort of like improve that by having an experience of the transfiguration at the start of it so that so you would know before you see that horrible suffering that christ went through you got a sense that he knew that he was going to achieve about the resurrection as well so for me that's the important thing about the writings of Luis Picaretta. it speaks so much about the human dignity and that's so much about the beauty of the human person and about Luis is going to be transformed and jesus is going wants to transform the whole earth into a new celestial paradise so when you read that, it gives you great hope and encouragement as you go through the purifying trial to surrender and to move to become more Christ-like. It just gives you so much hope and courage. So that's what was the great thing about me when I was in the seminary. And it was a great time of even every day is like a day of surrendering God and a great trust and going through great trials and difficulties. And whether it be, you know, sometimes it could be physical suffering, sometimes an emotional suffering, sometimes a very social way there's been a tragedy in the parish community so there's a great a social suffering there as i read the writings of louis Picard and see that god did so many beautiful things in her and she achieved such great wisdom and knowledge and such great respect from her parish and the community and she was able to entice uh, a, a saint now we call him saint Annabel de francia mm -hmm. so and that was a big thing for me that he was a blessed when i started to learn about louis's writings in 1997 and so oh well if this priest he was actually well known for his ministry as a vocations a director and i'm and i've been the vocations a director for my diocese and i and i had a break for a while and i am now again so to, to read about him and such a prominent well-known theologian and respected man and to see how she gave him great hope and encouragement and the priests around her and her parish priests when they would go and visit her and to pray with her to see the 
a great encouragement that she gave them and a great belief of what God is doing um, on the earth and this renewal that he's working mm. is really great encouragement and it gives it's always given me great a sense of hope and even joy and just and belief and just sort of yeah because some of the trials mm. and sufferings that people go through are so profoundly deep and so profoundly traumatic and even what's happening at the moment you know in the media and so forth we see yeah. horrible things happening and to have that sense of this complete renewal i mean it really i mean that's what was the um you know in the hours of the Passion and also the writings of Luis Picoletta makes um, the statement that the apostles were so um, traumatised by the Passion of Jesus, it was so horrific that um, that's why they scattered and they were so um, scared. But um, whereas someone like Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, she knew that, that Christ was going to be resurrected. She had internalised those scriptures on the third day. So Mary had that great interior peace and joy through it all um, as well. So that's what the writings of Luis Picoletta mm do for me as I read them, I can see a, a sense of this beautiful interior transformation and growth. And, you know, what encourages me, a lot of the people who I know who read the writings of Louis Picaretta are part of these prayer groups, are people who've gone through deep trials and really great profoundly difficulties. And so I think the way it's given them hope and even a joy because, you know, it's really about vision and about transformation. We know, you know, theologians say that Christ could redeem the human race with one drop of blood. <laughs> so why the passion, yeah. you know, why this huge, traumatic scourging and, and et cetera and so forth? Because it's more than just redeeming the human race. It's about a divinization of sharing in the full life of the Holy Spirit and for God. So it's lovely. And then you like, as you read the writings, you learn a lot about Adam. I remember at one stage in the seminary, um, one of our lecturers didn't believe that Adam and Adam and Eve existed, you see. So that's why something <laughs> like the writings Louis Picoretta can unjar mm. some people who don't believe Adam and Eve existed. I remember, you know, going to one of these conferences and a priest, a good holy priest, he was like he was sitting next to me and they were talking about that Adam had the gift of living the divine will. He shared in the divine nature, in original holiness and so forth as well. And he said, and well, I, I don't know if I believe there was an Adam and Eve, so I'm struggling here. <laughs> so for me, it was mm. like... Um, does the church actually teach about Adam and Eve? So what do you do? You go to the catechism. Mm -hmm. So I went to the catechism. Yeah. yeah, the catechism is very strong about Adam and Eve. Um, and so it, I would read about the catechism and about Adam and Eve and about it. And then you get drawn into, again, um, theology like Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body, that before original sin, there was original holiness, original solitude, and original nakedness. And these mm. origin and then, so it draws you into the sense of Adam before the fall and you know, God wants to restore that on earth. And then you start to read the book of Revelations, how, you know, Jesus speaking to the seven churches in the book of Revelations, which we're going through at, um, in the divine office at the moment of the church. And at the end of speaking to these seven churches, Jesus gives them a profound promise of that. Look, you're going through a terrible trial, I know, but if you persevere, he says things like, I will let you share my throne or I'll give you a new name. You know, like he's basically saying you can share in my nature. And that's so it's, mm. so, yeah, so it's quite beautiful um, um, to read these writings. It gives you such great hope and purification. A lot of people, um, they or they say or, or argue that um, the ideas of related to divine will aren't present in the scripture. But as, as you're saying, they're, they're deeply embedded, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. You only have to read the writings of a St. Paul, um, you know, clearly who... I think he uses the phrase, in Christ Jesus, um, 56 times. He says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me as well. So Pauline is yeah, so yeah. profoundly, I mean, that's one of the talks I give where we go through, you know, some of the Paul's letters and so forth, um, like Ephesians and so forth as well about, you know, sharing in Christ's nature, um, you know, about, you know, Christ is our brother and sister, you know, so forth. Um, so we're the sister or brother of Christ. So, yeah, very much. And then you got the, uh, the whole Gospel of John, you know, where Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and says, um, if you don't understand me talking to you about things of the earth, how are you going to understand I talk mm. to you things about heaven? And you've got to be born anew. And Nicodemus scratches his head and says, how can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? Um, so, things. so slowly in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus is leading them into this um completely new level of what's known as um, the, the relationship of the beloved a disciple and then you know that the climax of chapter 17 you know may they be one as we are one so mm -hmm. christ is praying that we share in the life of the trinity as well, well. so so scripture is very much all through i'm um, all through scripture i know you sort of like i'm going to tease out your know, scripture has its um 
journey in growth. One of the examples I used is that I love how Jesus, um, he does a bit of a Teresa Avila interior castle thing in scripture where he calls his followers by progressively different names, each name leading to a deeper level of connection and relationship. First, he calls them servants. Then he calls them disciples. Then he calls them friends. Then he calls them after the resurrection, he calls them brothers and sisters. And then you got that verse by John of saying, we are already brothers and sisters in the future. We shall become even more. So, so there's this wow. progressive drawing into deeper levels mm-hmm. into Christ. Uh, as a group. So it's a journey. And um, even in my day, like every day when um, I find it's a bit of a journey of journeying through the gospel narrative or the levels of the spiritual life, you know, sometimes, you know, I feel like, like deeply mystical, you're very practical, of just loving your neighbour in a very simple servant form, just being mm-hmm. a simple servant priest. But at night time, I find it's a beautiful time where in that beautiful quiet time before I go to sleep, I open up the book of heaven and I read these beautiful, deeply profound. It's like me and my spouse speaking beautiful, deep love poetry to each other, how God's mm. forming in me to share in his divine nature and how he's called me to become another child of God. So that's um, and that his very life can actually radiate in me. And and even to understand that theologically, how um, you know Christ had two wills. It took the church 600 years to define Christ had the two wills. That was a 100-year argument. <laughs> so, wow. so, and then, so Christ had a divine will and then he had a human will, but he never allowed his human will to operate. He Actually, a divine will operated through the human will. The human will just wow. Wow. Um, um, consented to it. So, so then that idea of allowing this divine will, which I received at baptism, to operate in me and to work in me and to allow christ to work more and more through me so i think so yeah so that that's purification you know and, mm, mm. and as i read the writings just on some more like practical little levels i would read how um how jesus would talk about the church and talk about priests and talk about priesthood and the struggles how the church needed to be changed and reformed and purified and little hints like he said even in holy things you can be doing your own wills <laughs> in holy things so that really struck me when i was wow, in you know, wanting to have where, like where does it say that? Is that in the scriptures? Oh, that's oh, that's in the scriptures as well. Yeah, but that's also um, in the writings of Luis Picaretta as well. And right. the scriptures uh, is in the sense of the um, scribes and the Pharisees. You know, clean the inside yes, of the cup. Yes, yes, yep. Good point. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, and you've got sort of like the scriptures slowly a journey. Um, that's very much um, you know, John and Paul line as well. You know, Paul there in his own. You know, when I'm weak and then I'm strong. Not or Zachariah, not by might or by or by strength, it's about by, through my spirit. So a lot of um, scriptures allude allude to the whole doing holy things, the mm. temple things. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it all sort of like leads to a crescendo in the book of Hebrews. You know, about the refiner's fire, and you become the temple of God, and the temple now the curtain, his arm, um, are torn, and we become the new mm. temple of God. So the Holy Spirit of God operates in us so yeah so just helping me when i was in the seminary as a very even now enthusiastic zealous into you know getting worked up about um you know how much incense to put in the therapy <laughs> or, or wearing <laughs> wearing more expensive vestments and things like that it started to help me to understand of doing holy things i say i can have actually just as much of an ego as a priest as i could as if i was a lawyer you know what i mean so the whole focus on mm. allowing god to operate in me and to transform me um, um, as well. So that was um, yeah, very important as I was reading about other priests, the connection with family and how, we, and how Jesus would speak about the church and how um, it needed to be transformed and purified. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about this purification that a lot of people are talking about that the church is mm. currently undergoing and whether that is a chastisement and what does chastisement mean according to the Louisa and the divine will, and what's the difference between purification, chastisement, punishment? Is that is God punishing the church, or what, what's happening in the current days of confusion? And we see, um, you know, a lot of things happening recently. We saw yesterday with Bishop mm. Mar Marie that he was mm. um, he was stabbed, and things like that happening in the church. It's really causing a lot of um, you know people are being uh, really astounded and shocked. Mm a lot of things happening yeah no that's a, that's a huge topic um i would just can um about luisa picaretta just for her what happened in um Carato, and just the priests who came to her visit her and just the deeper 
I think it's a really call it to depth in the spiritual life. Sure, it's a purification. We know that the whole the church, we know the catechism says that um, we are the body of the Christ. Everything that Christ had to go through, the church has to go through as the body of Christ um, as well. So, yes, yeah, so God allows uh, the church to go through the um, for trials and the difficulties for, to become, you know, the pure bride. It's a bit of the mm. book of Revelations, the, uh, the spotless bride mm, mm. Uh, as well. So that's... Um, Yes, the purification, uh, that's, you know, if you read a John the Cross, you know, he's actually very, very good on the purification. Um, I like his analogy that if a bird is tied with 50 pieces of string, even if 49 pieces are cut, if there's one piece of string left, the bird ain't going to fly. <laughs> so the mm. church needs to have um, all these pieces of string uh, which are cut um, sort of things. So it's a natural growth. Mm. I mean, I remember Pope Francis making a point I mean, one of his talks that it can seem like the church uh, is... Um, not as strong as it was, but if you look at the context in some ways, the church in the West has never been as strong as it is now in the sense that mm -hmm. in the 50s, everybody went to Mass. It was a cultural thing. Um, everything was closed. There was no football, no shops. It's part of you put on your Sunday best and everybody went to church, you know, and that was a good thing, you know. And then mm. you know, in the 50s, that 75% um, of Catholics went to church or something like that as well. That was good and people were holy, but... Um, how, and then there comes, uh, God wants to take that to a deeper level. Um, they were actually, uh, you know, when God allows through science now access to sin, <laughs> you know, even through, you know, once upon a time, if you wanted to, you know, see um, um, like dodgy images or sort of like lustful images, you'd go and get a magazine. Now you're just in mm, your phone. Mm, you know, so mm, yeah. God has allowed science progressively to make sin more and more accessible. And this is in the writing of the St. Paul about uh, the lawlessness at the end days of things. So God has allowed the church to be purified because, um, you know, more and more um, society doesn't need the church, doesn't have to go to church. So the ones who do have got a profoundly deep faith. I like to encourage my congregation all the time by saying um, I really have a great love for people who go to Mass on Sunday because no one's forcing them anymore. They're not there for cultural reasons. They're quite mm -hmm. the opposite mm -hmm. of going against the grain. So yeah, this, yes, whole, exactly. this whole purification the process, uh, the Lord... Um, allows the purification. He will. Uh, you can. The Lord. A society is on um, time, and the whole human story of man is on a trajectory, you know, towards the kingdom of God. We know that. So the Lord has allowed. And it's beautiful when you read the history of the church and the period of, of the churches. You know, period of the church's growth and maturity as a human being to now this stage as well. We've got so much deep theology. We've got the Blessed Sacrament, the Sacrament of Confession. All these things took hundreds of years to develop. Uh, for realization we have now to strengthen us to be able to fight an onslaught of such readily available um sin in sin, fact you know it's easy now you know the whole initial sin was wanting to be like god and now you can in many ways you can through your if you're an affluent lifestyle you can build a bubble around you through holiday and work and family friends and some of the things as well so you can do all that you can even now develop a theology around you we know pope benedict spoke about all the isms that have been sort of like the created. Mm. I was there in um in 2010 at the year of the priest, and he said to the priest, "How many isms or theologies or ideas have we heard about now in the world?" You know, so there's, so you can choose your own um like philosophical outlook. So that's the Lord's allowing all that. That's right. And that's why hand in hand, He's allowing like the writings of Luisa Picaretta, living the divine more and a new rebirthing of like divinization. And, you know, and, and hand in hand with Luisa Picaretta, we're seeing it in other saints like St. Therese of Lisieux, who said, I want to be the heart of the church. This little enclosed nun died in obscurity. All of a sudden, uh, her book just spreads like wildfire, and then all these miracles happened through her. When she came to Australia, well, her relics came to Australia in 2002. I was a parish priest in Goulburn. And just to see that town transformed, I remember hearing 600,000 Australians went to see the relics of St. Therese of Lisieux, this lady in a convent. Wow. Like that's yeah, that's an island was completely emptied apparently to see that. So, <laughs> added that happens, the church is, you know, you know, getting a new grasp of um, the interior life, the interior surrender, the interior vulnerabilities, the interior making decisions of wanting to, you know, go against the grain of all these temptations. Just the powerful impact that has interiorly of a connection with God, and then you, you know, you read the other saints like Elizabeth of, of Trinity, one of her contemporaries, and to see. You know, our hands on Balthazar say that Elizabeth the Trinity achieved a level of holiness in um, not at extra but at intra to the Trinity. It's just like amazing stuff. And mm. so, the, so that's this whole purification of the Lord's allowing uh, more and more 
of the church. And part of that purification is external persecutions as well. That's a bit of a, a new thing as well. The chastisements from the um, yeah, from the writings of Louisa Picaretta are sort of like an ultimate um, and for God, if nothing else works for God, he will allow exterior crosses and sufferings mm. to really to prompt the church into just that final level of holiness. We see that in the book of Revelations with the chastisement mm. of the seven churches there um, in Asia um, sort of thing as well. So, I mean, the beautiful thing about that is that even in the chastisements, um, you know, God's with us and helps us and transforms us, particularly through devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, mm. As well as the God Our Lady, help of Christians. Yeah, that, and the other one behind my head is enunciation yeah. um, as yeah. well. So it's a purification. So God allows more and more your purifications at deeper levels. That's one of the great revelations of the writings of Luisa Picaretta. Mm -hmm. when you see that, uh, she was purified so much. You know, she she achieved you know what um, is claimed apparently um, a mystical marriage in the mid twenties. You know, and then she they kept on going to be purified, purified. That's sort of like. Um, you know, I'm quite amazed. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I like it and I'm fascinated by it is because usually when a saint achieved a point of, we could say, mystical marriage, mm -hmm. that's when they died and they stopped writing. You know, there's a beautiful, beautiful testimony of um, saint. Like the climax. Yeah, climax. Thomas Aquinas, after he'd write all this beautiful summer theologica, this huge, beautiful, profound writings, he had a vision of God and he said, everything I've written now is straw, I'm not going to write anything more. And he did. It's like, oh, that's not nice. That's not fair. <laughs> so, whereas, whereas that's where Louisa Picaretta starts, you see. So I remember even reading John of the Cross, a commentator made the point, you know, when John of the Cross really started to get into interior union with God, he stopped writing. And that's a shame. So that's what the beautiful thing about Louisa Picaretta is that mm. through Jesus's sharings to her he shares the mystical life of heaven your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so how is the divine will done on earth in heaven as distinctively from done on earth so some of the things he shares with her and then you know it's so amazingly profound of what um the profound union god wants to do with the human being and then you read papal writings of this uh, infinite dignity of the human person and other writings mm. John Paul II, and he's a document on the third millennium, said things like the third millennium is open to infinite possibilities in Christ. You know, when you really see what God wants to do with the human nature, human beings, we haven't even started. But there has to be, you know, such a level of purification for God to fully release his Holy Spirit. I mean, if you've had any experience of the charismatic movement <laughs> when the Holy Spirit really releases his gifts. So the level of purification which a speaker or a presenter needs for the Holy Spirit to move in power, that's just like a really, really deep level of like a surrendering mm -hmm. God. Um, so the level, I mean, it, it's at the point, it's nice, like the writings of Louis Pegg in the Book of Heaven speak almost like um, that purification God wants to bring to a level where you can control your imagination. <laughs> that's a really deep level of purification because wow. if God wants to, do the, you know, share in the divine nature of God, let's say, and which which will happen, you know, that's what the Gospels talk about, to God to share fully his divine nature if you're sharing that that divine power you know you, like imagine if you started i wonder what it'd be like if mars never existed <laughs> and mars happens to disappear <laughs> so yeah so that's a deep level of the purification of you know the imagination of just interior and and there's just very beautiful practical things that go uh, simultaneously with that it's, and that's one of the reasons i like the writings of the Picaretta and mystical writings is that the more mystical you become, the more down to earth you become. That's the good sign, to be honest, whether you are really mm. reading mystical writings. You become more earthy, down to earth, practical. More humble. More humble. And the, first, and, like, and the reverse is really important in that regard too as well because there are some ordinary everyday things I find I cannot overcome with, without becoming deeply mystical. In the sense, if you have had a profound wounding from your childhood, a really deep, profound wounding, even just getting up in the morning can be profoundly difficult for some people. It just can be like depression can be such a gripping thing. But to know that you are a child of God, you can just use it as a mantra. God wants me to share in God's divine nature. That gives you profound grace and hope just to do everyday things. The most the simplest thing of being mm. charitable to someone who cuts you off into traffic and someone who is trying wants you to do something which is just that goes against your grain or just you struggle with you say or someone really um presses your button you say that's a child of god that person's called to share the dignity of god so it helps me to overcome even a little thing but i do find this is my experience maybe other people mm. don't don't need that but there are certain 
everyday routine things as a priest, just being everyday faithful to my ministry, offering the sacraments. I'm, I need that sense of God's doing this to help me to share in the divine nature um, as well. So. Sorry, is, is there going to be a stage? Oh, sorry, go on. Marina, you had a question? Uh, how do you apply the uh, writings of Louis Such everyday life uh, if you're facing difficult uh, situations and people? Um, they're, yeah, they're very they're practical. Going practical. into your nothingness, but uh, mm -hmm. could you expound further a bit Yeah, more? sure. It develops in you a sense of um, I want God's will to be done and not my will to be done. That's a practical, but... I want God's will to be done in me and through me. I don't want to be the operating factor. I want the Holy Spirit to be animating me and to operating through me as well. So that's the a difference between doing God's will and like living in God's will. It's almost a level. It's, it helps you to foster a, a presence and awareness of the Holy Spirit to work through you. So so you're constantly in an interior way, you know, doing things, discovering God's will. For a while, you know, you can fall into the trap of us of being uh, indecisive. Is this God's will? Is that God's will? <laughs> and then yes. you journey through that and then you become more of an interiorly aware of promptings and movements of God's spirit and just interior strengths and just, um, you know, and then drawing in prayer and through the times of the Blessed Sacrament as well. But it's it's a journey in the sense that, um, you know, whenever you read like the life of St. Francis, it's a particular journey to when he got the stigmata as well. So as you read the life of Louis Figueroa and you read a great saint or a great mystic, you go on the journey that they went through and you go through similar hurdles as well. So, I was going to ask you about um, what's to come according to the Book of Heaven and what does yeah. it mean, um, the, the the kingdom of the divine will and the era of peace? What, what does that mean to you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, it's that prayer there, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, um, so, so that God's moving the whole church and the whole world to a fullness in Christ. Uh, so we know there'll be um, through just biblical prophet, um, you know, Luke, what is it, chapter 25, you know, Jesus will come again. Um, and we know through the church writings like St. Bernard, there's an intermediary coming of Christ where the church will mm. achieve a Eucharistic reign, a fullness of a new springtime in Christianity um, as well. So there'll be basically um, saints we know uh, do God's will, but they do God's will with such depth and such complete interior transformation and surrender that the holy spirit can work through them to completely animate and change the, uh, the spiritual climate and temperature around them mary mckillop is a good example you know she had that interior touch of god and movement towards god she created a whole order of nuns around her and then um transformed education for poor children in the bush and so forth as well so um i mean one of the ways i look at it is that if you become really too close to god Two things traditionally happen to you. What two things happen to you, Marina, would you guess? <laughs> Glad you're not asking me. <laughs> <laughs> what two um, things are traditionally, if you became really close to God, you have two options usually. Oh, all right. So, to, my experience is uh, I've become very humble um, in mm. my humility. Um, I learned to uh, sort of embrace this cross. This is my experience, Father. Um, and I've learned in the last few weeks that I've been thanking him uh, for the, the, the gifts from heaven, every suffering that I endure, uh, the gifts from heaven. And um, and that's what I'm learning actually, even through the writings of Luisa Picaretta, to just go into my nothingness. Mm -hmm. And from that, I feel renewed and transformed every moment. Um, mm -hmm. Each time I remember the writings of Luisa and uh, again, as you said, Father, um, you know, surrendering my will to him. It just, it just opens up this wonderful... Um, feeling emotion uh that is it's just amazing and um and then you i i and i become part of his uh spirit jesus spirit so it's just beautiful perfect fantastic that's the third way you described the, you described <laughs> the third you. way but the third way is what the writings of lewis pecker living the divine world is traditionally the two ways are either you mm. become a hermit or you become a martyr so uh -huh. that so those are the, if you look at church history, when someone really gets close to God, they either go off and become a hermit because they can't live in the mm. world yes. or they become a martyr like, like St. Stephen. But now what God is doing that third way, God's allowing, he doesn't want his um, children to be, start to get a profound union in them. He doesn't want them to become hermits and he doesn't want them to become all martyrs. <laughs> so mm. some will obviously, but, and they're going to be in society and be interiorly radiate the Holy Spirit. So the new become 
I just like it's very Marian too. So that's the key of um, a Mary was able to walk in the fullness of God. Like scriptural speaking, to look at it just very quickly, scriptural perspective is the whole scriptural journey could be looked at. Who could walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? All through, ever since the fall of Adam, saints like Moses and Elijah had little um, presences of the Holy Spirit. Even King David had like mm. touches. His sister David, the Spirit seized upon him when he was anointed and never left him. But no one could fully walk in the Holy Spirit until a Jesus had the full presence of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus wants to raise other apostles who could share in the divine life on the Holy Spirit, and that's going to radiate in communities and places. And they will reach, please God, um, a tipping point. We will reach sort of like um, where people will start to see in the witnesses of people um, there's a joy and a presence and an interior connection that comes with the life in God through the sacraments of the Eucharist and confession and life and through reading the mystics that mm. um, they're missing out upon. It's not a bit, the material things, you know, can't give you a level of joy. And you cannot, even other relationships that people are trying to find in relationships, something which only God can give them that uh, has to be that interior like a presence of God um, as well. It's very much, um, yeah, so that's how I see this new era coming about as purifications unfold and chastisements and difficulties unfold, more and more the people will go into prayer and go into intercession and encounter with God. And we know, you know, there's, um, mm. you know, it's like the warning and illumination of the conscience and that, uh, which the Lord will more and more, it's lovely to hear Father Celso speak about, you know, what's going to happen is going to be such a beautiful era. There's going to be such outpourings of grace and miracles, just like the early church in many ways, and such astounding miracles because as people more and more let go of the world and let go of um, human uh, supports and, and like human um, yeah, yeah, crutches, um, mm. uh, the beautiful presence of God. And, you know, you read the book of Isaiah where it says, you know, the sun will glow seven more times more brightly and even the bells of the cows mm. will be holy, you know, um, yes. sort of thing. So that's it's a beautiful um, just to keep on as we see these horrible things um, unfold and that people being hurt and uh, that to pray for them, to love them interiorly, enter into a place of prayer with God, to read and hope of a new era that's about to unfold in a beautiful, glorious world, which we can't imagine at the moment. Well, that's very, very hopeful. It's an interior martyrdom we suffer, isn't it? Uh, that's right. It's interior. I mean, it's interior to martyrdom. That's exactly right. So it's... Um, yeah, that's what I mean. Those things you spoke about, nothingness and surrender, are so important concepts um, that really are brought, highlighted and unfolded in the writings of Louisa in the Book of Heaven. You describe it so beautifully, Father Emil. It's absolutely beautiful to hear what you have to say. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's okay. It's a gift. It's all Mary. It's very much going to be a Marian era. You know, Mary was the first one living the divine. Well, you only have to unpack the idea of Mary was mother of God, you know, the dogma in the mm. fourth century and that. Uh, how could Mary be the mother of God? That's allowing this idea of this, the divinity operated in her. You know, that one of the concepts you learn about for the Book of Heaven, which is so beautiful because it gives you these thoughts you never really thought about before, is that, um, you know, God can be your prime act in what moves you. You know, you've got the first letter of John, so the first chapter of John that says, for those who allow themselves to become uh, um, changed by Christ, they were born not of flesh or will of man, but of will of God. And then, um, you know, John also in his first verse speaks about the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh. But these interior motivations and promptings, in some ways, is very uh, an Ignatian spirituality in some ways that allow the movements of the spirit to be your prime act and the motivation. But, yeah, so that's, um, it's lovely to see how Mary, uh, to become other daughters and sons of Mary and to imitate her and to become uh, such beautiful uh, children of God. I know that you, I've been told that you're also involved in the Marian movement. Is that right? With Father Gobi's? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I've got to be careful as a priest. You always try to put sort of like <laughs> one hat on and another hat on. <laughs> so, um, I sort of like, yeah, so with my Marian movement of priest hat on, oh, for sure, the Cynicals. I mean, those were the two books I've been reading um, up all my priesthood ever since I was mm. seminary. I would read the Blue Book at night time. And one of the locutions from Father Gobi, and I read one of the passages from the Book of Heaven um, as well. But that's another. Yeah. You've got to interview me another time about the Marian. That, that'll be another topic. But yeah, because you brought up the the Marian aspect of the divine that's divine right. will, so I thought um, that's that right. kind of connects, doesn't it? It does. I have, it does. The, I have the book, Father. I have the book with me. That's right. I'm at the moment. I'm leading my parish into the 33 day consecration to Our Lady. There's 
33 Days to Morning Glory by Father Michael Gately. So one of the first things I do in a parish, I invite everybody to join me in that. So we've got to become children of Mary. Um, um, I, think I was uh, sharing on Mass on a Sunday that um, beautiful article um, in a conference in Sydney uh, speaking about Mariology of the third millennium, that the 70s was a decade without Mary. The first time in the Western Church mm. that there was um, a decade with, and how in Canberra that was pretty uh, devastating because a lot of the parishes were formed in the 70s in Canberra. So they lacked this profoundly deep Marian sense that mm. was throughout church history just naturally part of people's spiritual life was Mary's your mother of the order of grace, I think. So, yes. so, 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 so that's based on the St. Louis de Montfort, who also mm. you know, shared uh, that the um, Our Lady is going to raise um, children in this new, in a new millennium that will tower above previous saints the way the cedars of Lebanon towered above shrubs, this sense of this new sanctity that Mary's working. But... Yeah, Mary. And that's, uh, that's in the writings of um, Louis de Mont Saint Louis de Montfort, isn't it? It is. That's exactly right. And the, the beautiful, beautiful and the beautiful writing of Louis. So I think that's one of the ones to start on is um, is the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Divine Will. Particularly, the start of it describes um, it's a bit like the mystical city of God by Mother Mary Greta. That you get that mystical sense of Mary, and it describes because Mary was conceived with original sin uh, in the Immaculate Conception. She had an intimacy with God, a naturalness to God the Father an interior spiritual life that we can't even dream of at the moment. So if you read the rites of the other lives of the mystics and some of their writings, like Lois Picketta, those first six chapters that speak about Mary's life as a child is quite amazingly, beautifully profound of how um, interiorly we can be have a, like a connection with God. So that's a wonderful, wonderful mm. book. Um, What's the name of the book again, Father, for those that yeah. want to read it? So that's... The Blessed Virgin Mary in the Divine Mourns, and the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Divine Mourns, yeah. the ones that have an imprimatur by uh, St. Annabel de Francia. So he put his oh, imprimatur, right. as we know, on that one, The Hours of the Passion and the first 19 volumes of the Book of Heaven. No, I, I think uh, Father Emil has uh, covered um, the entire topic, actually, uh, quite beautifully and uh, very elegantly put. Uh, and um, I could listen to more of uh, what you have to say, Father Emil. So I just... Uh, I, I've had, uh, I've learned a lot today. It's beautiful. Thank so you. Father, my, my final question, if you could help us, how can we quicken this kingdom, this gift or this kingdom of the divine will in the world and bring about an era of, you know, a great era of Christian Christianity and a great era of the divine will? How do we bring that about in, in a quicker way? Mm. Oh, well, as we know, only... Um... Only God can do it, sort of thing. But um, the surrender mm -hmm. is the big thing. Um, prayer, you know, a lady says in Medjugorje, pray, 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 you know. So that's the, um, uh, to pray the hours of the passion is a powerful, to reflect on the on the passion of our Lord. Um, that's a big thing, um, sort of thing. So that's what mm -hmm. I do, you know. I, I fit my whole day around prayer. You've got the two things of um, serving the community and praying. So you go back and forth in between the two. You receive God's love. You know, 1 John 4, 18, we love because God loved us first. So the more you can access God's love and to be aware of his love and be edified by his love and transformed and moved by his love is how we quicken the era. Um, so that to pray and hope, to allow God's love in your prayer time before the Blessed Sacrament, receiving the Eucharist, reading the mystical writings like Luis Picaretta, the Book of Heaven, uh, just say to God, I... I no longer want to do my will, but I want to live in your divine will and I want your divine will to animate me the way it animated Jesus and, and animated Our Lady. So so that's the mm. that's the focus, allowing encountering God's love and then allowing yeah. that love to flow through you and into the people around you. So it's an ongoing dynamic. Um, Amen. Thank you so much. Father, could you finish us off with a um with a blessing and a final sure. prayer? So Lord, we do pray for particularly people who are going through great trials and difficulties in the spiritual life and the personal life, maybe struggles with marriage, struggles with physical health, struggles with job and employment, maybe simply putting food on the table, a roof over the head, or even knowing that they're part of um, they have a home and a, and a group of friends where they know they are loved and supported and cared for. We pray for those who are going through great challenges in their spiritual life, great darknesses and difficulties where the heavens seem shut and, they, and heaven seems quiet and they cannot encounter and experience your love. So uh, we pray for them. We hold them up all to you. We ask our Mother Mary to enfold them in her her immaculate mantle. And in this um, season, as we're journeying into Pentecost, we implore you for your grace, Lord, as it says in the book of Hebrews, Jesus pleaded 
in um, tears and cries for the heavens to be opened. And we're now at the, at the baptism of the Lord. The heavens were opened and the Lord said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And then at the end of the Gospel of Mark, um, the veil of the temple was torn right down the middle. And now the heavens are open now, Lord. It's own, and these are the times through so much church history, Lord, that there's been so many saints have gone before us pleading on their knees. And just like uh, for thousands of years, the people of Israel pleaded for the Messiah. Now for uh, thousands of years, the people of God, the, the body of Christ have pleaded for and now pouring the fullness of the presence of the Holy Spirit to wipe away every tear from every cheek. So we add our uh, our prayers with theirs, all the people who have gone before us, with all the difficulties the world is going through. We unite with one great chorus under the mantle of Our Lady. And we say, may your kingdom come now on earth as it is in heaven, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And God bless you if you are struggling in a great trial difficulty. We pray that you would encounter uh, the infinite love of God and also great strength and peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.